Hey, and welcome to The Office Field Guide. My name's Chris, and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever, and today, we're looking at season five's finale, Company Picnic. It's six to six, it's a nail biter. Oh, Kevin! Today, we're gonna be talking about some behind the scenes stuff. We'll get emotional. You gotta be kidding me! You gotta be kidding me! And we'll commemorate the first 100 episodes of The Office. Oh. If you don't remember, Company Picnic is all about this huge spider in my baseball mat. Don't forget about the comment contest down here. And warning, there will be series spoilers ahead. Warning, 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 warning. Ah! And with that, let's play. I understand nothing. Company Picnic was written by Paul Lieberstein and Jennifer Salata, and it was directed by Ken Quapis. Paul and Jen were acting as showrunners throughout season five, and by this point, they were running out of steam. Phyllis, why are you sitting on the ground? We've been out here for a while. I don't need this. <sighs> and rightfully so. This was not only the finale for season five, but it was the 100th episode of The Office. Oh, I think it's 18 hundo. With Salada saying, I crashed a little bit before the table read for Company Picnic. I was lying under the table in the conference room and only my feet were visible. All I could pitch were Creed jokes because my brain was gone. But Paul got us through the finish line and then we went to the table read and it went really well. Steve started telling Paul how great it was, but Paul said he felt like the shell came down over him. He saw Steve's mouth moving, but he couldn't hear a word. It was like the end of finals at school. We'd been running on adrenaline for so long, and now that was over, we both just completely crashed. And I have to agree with that telephone quote here from Carell. The writing in this one is something special, which must have been a breath of fresh air for Steve to get to do something new and different. But we're gonna get to that later. I'm gonna skip talking about the cold opening for now. We'll get to that one later. Interestingly though, this official cold opening credit sequence was trimmed down to just 10 seconds. This wasn't an attempt to get this episode to fit the network mandated time frame of 21 minutes and 35 seconds. I looked it up online afterwards. According to an interview with Salada and the TV Guide, while in the editing room, they kicked around fleshing this episode all the way into an hour long episode, much like many of the preceding season finales. <laughs> But there just wasn't enough plot points to warrant an hour long, which was probably the best choice. Ow, my ankle! What happened? I twisted it. You weren't even moving. In my mind, this episode lives as an hour long, but it's definitely not. It's just a very compact episode. I thought the easiest way to really talk about this one is just to break it down into the different acts. So start with act one. We have a setup for the picnic. Must be nice to get a rest from all your rest. In the first act, we also get just a sense of the depth that this story's history has, with cameos from non-mainstay characters like Bob Vance, Holly, AJ, You can go to hell. Charles, Spencer Daniels actually made a return in this deleted scene. This party sucks, Meredith. Tell me how. Computers, Meredith. In the car. Now. All day. Again and David Rogers as the Ray-Bans guy. These are expensive Ray-Bans, jackass. And then also Kendall. Really, really funny. Really funny. Kendall, by the way, is played by John Hartman, who has a memorable role in another Michael Schur show, The Good Place, as Bart, the couples therapist. Back to the first act, as expected, we get a lot of stories set up here with Jim and Pam, and their playfulness gets me every time. Do you want me to beat them up for you? No, I shouldn't have to ask you to do stuff like that. You should just do it. Michael's plan for Holly is also revealed. Holly, you and I are soup snakes. Which is set up like it will play out like a rom-com. Doesn't what I said mean anything to you? I'm sorry, Harry. I know it's New Year's Eve. I know you're feeling lonely, but you just can't show up here, tell me you love me, and expect that to make everything all right. But it does play out quite differently. You bet your fat ass we are. Then all of this is on the backdrop of a company volleyball game. Some of the stress the writers had came from the fact that they only had about one weekend to finish the script and get it out to the actors. They didn't connect at that time that Jenna Fisher might not be able to do the physical acting that this script required. Maybe I played a little in junior high and in high school, maybe a little in college. 
and went to volleyball camp most summers. Pretending to have PMS so I didn't have to play volleyball. Those were the days. And Salada said they screwed up there. Her quote said, I didn't remember that she said that, specifically about volleyball. And we really do try to be careful about these things. So Fisher did have some difficulties pulling this off, so Quapis brought in some stunt doubles to do the work, and they used some CG trickery to bridge some gaps. What? Much like that soccer ball to the face. Oh my God. Speaking of extras, according to the interview in TV Guide, Quapis had over 350 extras to pull off this episode, which was shot over four days. Extra, extra, read all about it. Newspapers for sale. All of which were instructed not to react in any way to this skit. I'm Robert Dunder. I'm Robert Mifflin. Also in the TV Guide interview, Salata said that Carell and Ryan were not told that the crowd was gonna be stoic to make the actor's reaction of stage fright all the more cringeworthy. I will say, see a gun, he shot himself in the head. That is correct! Which obviously carries us into the second act, Michael and Holly laying down for this romantic setting. The cameras here are mounted rather than handheld, and the lighting, this easily makes for one of the most romantic shots in the series to date. All Michael's mannerisms, though, showing growth, especially compared to his relationship with Jan. That is a $200 plasma screen TV that you just killed! Good luck paying me back on your $0 a year salary plus benefits, babe! But we're gonna get more into that later. On top of all the great stuff that was written, Carell and Ryan did improvise some of the things in this episode, like Michael's Indian accent. $250 is more money than I've ever seen in my life. Medical school must have cost like 40 bucks or a donkey or something. Uh, no. The Jaws bit. Oh. Thunder, 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 thunder. And this line. We're circling it. Mm. Which is just an adorable moment. And the writers took some precautions to make sure that the ending of this episode did not leak out. Which leads us to the third act. The passive aggressive volleyball game is now in full force as Scranton tries to stick it to the man for attempting to keep the company alive. We're closing the Buffalo Branch. Oh You've got to be kidding me! Let's do this. I love that last shot, and there's a lot of great camera work in this episode. It really does feel like a company outing, but not one I've ever been. This was shot in Malibu. Anyway, the climax has two very powerful moments. First with the big Jim Pam reveal. They debated back and forth if this clip should have audio or not, but ultimately they decided that Krasinski and Fisher were great actors and their body language and expressions would be able to convey the meaning and the depth of this moment. This plot point does feel like it comes out of the blue though, but it was foreshadowed when Pam was being admitted to the hospital. No other radiation this year, no metal plates, no chance you're pregnant. I'm sorry, can we just hurry this up? I've got a game to get back to. Oh good, because my next question was, do you have a game to get back to? I thought it was played very well, in, in a way that you wouldn't really pick up on until you watch the episode again. I usually don't enjoy the theater, but this is delightful. Quapis' advice to Krasinski here, though, was to play this sequence off in a way that reminded us that the dock crew had been around Jim and Pam for years. And so the excitement of this news being shared is a joy to everyone in this whole space. As a byproduct, we, the audience, get to feel included in this world as well. All of this does feel like an homage to this intimate moment Tim and Dawn share in the British version of The Office. And while we don't get much closure on how the ball game ends, <laughs> I'll get it. We do get some closure on Michael's decision to let it be with Holly. And it's gonna take a long time. And then it's perfect. I'm in no rush. On top of all the emotions of the Jim and Pam vibes, this one had me bawling the first time I watched this. Character growth is something I appreciate through the roof in my TV shows and seeing Michael evolve to this point was beautiful. First time watching this though, I wondered if the writers really had a long-term plan for Michael and Holly. If she wasn't gonna join the main cast, I wasn't quite sure how to read Michael's sentiments here. I will see her every now and then and 
Maybe one year she'll be with somebody and the next year I'll be with somebody. Looking at the finished product though, I get all of the feels. Michael's confidence that she's the one, whether he can have her right now or not, is a testament to growth and faith in their relationship. And I love it. With that, let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Company Picnic is the 100th episode of The Office. As such, instead of having a regular deeper meaning, what I wanted to do is take a look back at the last 100 episodes. Let's start with Michael. His desire to be friends with his coworkers has been a highlight of the series. Okay, next. So tell me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be married and have a hundred kids so I can have a hundred friends and no one can say no to being my friend. God, you were, we totally got you. You're a jerk. I don't know about that. Try my cookie, cookie, try my... Would I rather be feared or loved? Um, easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. doesn't fire people, he hires people and inspires people. People, right? And people will never go out of business. I would do one with all the career growth that's occurred in the series, but they're all literally in the exact same place they started, except Pam. I don't think it would be the worst thing if they let me go, because then I might I just, I don't think it's many little girls dream to be a receptionist. Dunder Mifflin, this is Pam. 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 You gotta take a chance on something sometime, Pam. I mean, do you want to be a receptionist here always? Oh, excuse me. I'm fine with my choices. Oh. So, I'm never gonna... Dunder Mifflin, this is Pam. 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 Come on, are you, are you doing your best here? Are you being the best that you can be? Dunder Mifflin, this is Pam. I'm going with him. What?
Okay, then I want Pam back. Uh, you already have a new receptionist. There. Sales. Thank you. Pam's not a salesperson. Yes, she is. At the Michael Scott Paper Company, in its heyday. That's right. Okay. Please continue. And then there's the love stories. Dwight and Angela have had quite the ride. Andy put down a bunch of deposits on stuff for his wedding with Angela, but then she was sleeping with Dwight for several years. Wait, no, that can't be right. That timeline's messy. I'm asking no, guys, wait, you don't mean that. Leave it alone. Kelly and Ryan are the love story of the century. And then we have one half of the soul of the show. Jim said mixed berries? Oh, wow. Yeah, he's on to me. Um. <laughs> Come on, you can tell me. Jim, you can tell me anything. I'm in love with you. came up to my desk and you said, this might sound weird, mm -hmm. but that mixed berry yogurt you're about to eat has expired. That was the moment that you knew you liked me. Yep. And then there's Michaels. Yes, I thought that was you. Hi. Hi. Michael Scott, this is Jan Levinson Gould. Just Jan Levinson. Eh, no Gould? No. <laughs> No matter how badly I treat you or what I'm going through, you just, you are there for me. And that is a guy worth staying beside. Check, please. But let's rate this thing. 
This is the worst. First, if you could give this video a like and subscribe, that'd be the bee's knees. All right, the cold opening. So this cold opening is a lot of fun. Carell's body language here gets a chuckle out of me every time, and everyone working to pull this con off gives me a sense that everything's back to normal after the Michael Scott Paper Company story arc. And then there's my favorite line of this episode. You had to be there! <laughs> oh, okay, geography joke. It really gets me every time. But leave a comment with what your favorite line of this episode is. Jim and Dwight's little bromance starts to shine through here, though. What do you need from me? It's not the best cold opening of all time, but I'm giving it a five out of five. It's up there. <laughs> yeah! I think that rating this episode is difficult because Company Picnic has to deliver as a season finale of one of the biggest seasons of The Office. If we break The Office into its three main story building elements, cringe comedy, lowbrow comedy, and heartwarming, I think that this episode fires on all cylinders. Ah! With plenty of cringe. You suckers are going down. They're gonna wipe their asses with your serves. Piss all over your faces. Plenty of slapstick. I got it. Oh, oh Kevin, are come you on! Blind? I could have gotten you things what with a your eyeball. Sledge. And a closing act that has all of the feels. We have a lot of good material for next year's sketch. Just saying that makes me think it'd be cool to do an analysis at some point of all the season finales, what their goals are and how they closed arcs and created new ones and just kept us hooked. Suck on this. I don't know how Company Picnic would stack up against the rest of those though, but self-contained as a finale of an amazing season, it came and it delivered. That's what she said. <sighs> I give it also a five out of five, but that's just what I think about Company Picnic. Leave your thoughts in the comments along with the comment contest. I really wanna hear from y'all. Next week, we're gonna look at the whole season in a season five wrap up. We'll be talking about the best, the worst. We'll do some corrections and omissions from season five, and we're just gonna have some fun with it. And then we're gonna hit the ground running with season six. So if you're still with us, check out our Discord. It's a great time. Check out our channel memberships if you wanna support the channel. And if not, thank you just so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Season five seems so far away and the channel's growing. Super excited. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.